warm welcome and it's a it's a pleasure to be here with you all um so i i can't see any any faces so if anybody um has a question or just just raise their hand um uh, because i can't quite gauge what's happening with my with my screen sharing um, so I just want to give um, a thank you for the introduction. I just wanted to give a little bit of information about some of the work that we do at Global Rights Compliance on starvation. Um, and then from there, we'll go into just a brief kind of framework of the of the law um, and some of the material elements, which will sort of lead into how we look at those elements in the investigative work that we're doing in Ukraine and elsewhere. So since 2017, GRC and myself have been really leading the starvation and humanitarian crises portfolio. And what we've been doing there is working with a range of state and non-state partners, particularly humanitarian agencies, to advance the prevention, prohibition and accountability for starvation. We developed in 2019 a starvation training manual, the first on the market, which has subsequently been updated into Arabic and Ukrainian. Our principal focuses, as you can see on the screen there, have been situations of conflict-induced hunger, um, with a real um, forensic focus on Syria, South Sudan, Yemen, Tigray, and now Ukraine. We've also looked at North Korea um, and Venezuela for situations outside of conflict settings as well. Um, and here, if we just turn to some of the reports that we've produced over the years, this was our uh, Yemen starvation makers, then Tigray um, and South Sudan. And in due course, I'll talk to you a little bit about our partnerships with open source providers, because we've worked with pretty much all of the leading providers at this point um, and how that has transformed some of our investigative work. So Yemen and uh, Tigray were with Bellingcat and the South Sudan report was with um, the Centre for Information Resilience, who we continue to work with now in Ukraine, along with our other provider, IMSL. So I want to, um, uh, and this is the starvation training manual with the three frameworks, and then also um, last year, I think, uh, it was released, uh, the Starvation um, mobile app. Um, so there's the QR codes for anybody that is interested. Um, it's a really useful tool in terms of breaking down the legal framework, looking at templates, best practice for investigative methods, um, and also browsing, uh, yeah, browsing the library. So I want to start and kind of kick us off with um, uh, 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 something that our partner does, um, our friend and famine expert Alex DeWall, who I'm sure many of you will have heard of. This is a um, what happens when you uh, Google image search the term starvation, and this is typically the sort of images that come up or are the images that um, tend to be conjured when we're engaging with people. Over the last five years, we've really started to see um, some more Yemen related images appear in this search, but I would hesitate to say that still at this point, that this is how starvation is represented both in the media and also in our kind of collective understanding. And what I'd like to do throughout the course of the next 30 minutes or so is just to discuss how this crime and its consequences look rather different. Now, I want to just show you these um, uh, three possible starvation scenarios and just have you reflect on those. We don't necessarily need to talk about them at this point, but we can bring that into the Q&A later. But I just want you to take a look at those three scenarios and see whether you would view that now and then subsequently at the end of the session um, as to a possible starvation related conduct. Um, these all involve um, potentially starvation related elements and I'd like to discuss and, and understand with today's session what we hope will become slightly more obvious to you. So in that first scenario you can see medicine and healthcare workers, the second scenario relating to heating and then the third in relation to humanitarian aid supplies. I'll just pause there for a moment just to make sure everybody can read those and then we can talk about them collectively at the end. But really, first of all, the kind of starting principles, really, what do we mean when we talk about starvation? What is it that um, other than those images that are conjured in our minds? 
And so we came up at the early stages of our work in this space. I'm sorry for the beeping. That's, I think it's the lobby. I'm not quite sure how to switch that off. Um, what do we mean when we talk about starvation outside of just a, a purely um, the crime itself? So the definition that, that we produced um, collectively, again, also with Alex DeWall, is that starvation is the process of deprivation that occurs when actors impede the capacity of targeted persons to access the means of sustaining life. And so we'll talk in a moment about who we mean by targeted persons and what impediments that might frame. But as you can see there on the slide, there's two really important things to clarify. And both of these point to the most common misconceptions around starvation. And this was a lot of our early work was sort of myth busting, a bit similar to some of the work that was done around sexual and gender based violence in the early years is really trying to demystify what it is that, that the term means and the conduct and the consequences. So the first myth or misconception is really that starvation is simply about food. And as you'll link back to those earlier scenarios that we talked about, it really does encompass much more than hunger or nourishment. It is the deprivation of anything that is essential to survival. The term object uh, indispensable to survival is found in IHL and in the international criminal law definition. And helpfully under IHL, you have a broad range of, of items that are um, listed there in, in the additional protocol. And this includes both water installations, supplies, irrigation, medicine, clothing, shelter, fuel and electricity. And what we understand in our engagement with various prosecutors is that the means to sustain life and the term OIS is going to be interpreted broadly when it comes to um, that first prosecution. It's also important to raise, and we'll, we'll come back to this in, in, in a few slides time, that objects indispensable to survival are going to be situation specific. So what is essential to a South Sudanese mother in summer is going to be different to what is indispensable to a Ukrainian uh, elderly male in, a, in, in winter. So it's just important to, to focus on you know, that broader concept of what's essential to survival. And then the second is really um, the emphasis under international law is on the perpetrator. To starve means to cause suffering, whether that's psychological um, or by death or deprivation. And the light within the international um, criminal law framework is very much shone on the wrongdoing. So I am starving you as opposed to the consequence, you know, you are starving. And as we'll go into later, we'll see that as a material element of the crime, a consequence is, is not relevant. So if we turn then to um, how hunger occurs in conflict, now there are um, um, uh, infinite ways in which this appears to be happening in modern and um, more recent conflicts. Um, and it can take the, the way that this contributes to food insecurity can take really um, uh, a, a whole range of different um, modes of perpetration. But the most common ones that we have come across and the ones that we found quite helpful to organise in terms of our investigative planning have been to group it into three main causes. And these always lead us back to showing um, that the vast majority of times that this conflict induced food insecurity or starvation can be linked back to human conduct, whether that's omissions or commissions. So as you can see, these three um, broad buckets there where food sources are damaged and destroyed, and this can take place with looting or uh, attacks on food sources or attacks on humanitarian aid. And the report that we've just released in relation to the Ukrainian grain seizure, um, you'll see that both in the, the first bucket and then the third bucket. The second is access to food is limited. And again, the most common way we're seeing, particularly in relation to Ukraine, is the use of sieges and blockades, but then also direct attacks themselves on markets or um, uh, food producing areas, again, agricultural or again in, in the context of Syria, where you saw those sustained attacks on bakeries. And then the third is where agricultural activities are interrupted. And this is very, very common in times of conflict where you see a lot of the male population going into active um, conduct of hostilities. 
but it's also where agricultural infrastructure or agriculture itself is attacked. Um, and again, as I said, this is linked to this most recent report we released. Um, so if we turn then to how it is criminalised under international criminal law, in many ways, the crime is, is very much still in its infancy. And for a long time, it has been practically um, favoured and very much legally permissible. Uh, and indeed, the UK and its allies used it extensively in its combat operations in both world wars. Um, but the, the, the sort of curiosity with this crime and, and where really my involvement in the work started was why it hasn't been prosecuted on an international level before. And why, as we were seeing this re-emergence of global food insecurity and the use of it in conflict, there was this real disconnect with what was happening in the international courts, tribunals um, and the International Criminal Court itself. So the Rome Statute was the first time where starvation was formally penalised by an international judicial body, even though there were a host of other crimes, including genocide or crimes against humanity that would intersect with that starvation conduct. Um, the fact that it only appeared on the international stage with the Rome Statute meant that, again, despite seeing a lot of this conduct in Cambodia or in, in Yugoslavia, um, there was no standalone prosecution of the war crime of starvation at the international level, and that still remains the case. As you can see on the next slide, um, war crimes, of course, as you'll know, are, are violations of international humanitarian law. And the criminality of starvation emanates from IHL, where there are three specific sets of rules which have gained customary international law status. And these have very much informed the interpretation of the elements of the crime and how we go about um, uh, investigating them in, in practice. Uh, and I won't go into too much detail on that given the time. So here you'll see the International Criminal Law um, Rome Statute definition. And this is now following the Swiss Amendment and the work that GRC did with Switzerland and other member states. This has now been um, amended, the Rome Statute, for um, the historic amendment um, to include this crime under a non-international armed conflict, which again was very much um, where there was a, a, a real gap in the legal framework when I first started practising in this area. Um, given that the vast majority of conflicts pre-Ukraine were all in non-international armed conflicts, there was no international mechanism with which to prosecute that um, directly. So as you can see, um, here are the elements of the crimes. And, and um, as, a, as a barrister in the UK and, and a practising barrister on the international um, uh, level, for us, the elements of crime, certainly for me, is, is very much um, a sort of a cookbook um, of the ingredients of what make up uh, international crimes. Uh, and most or a lot of practitioners, certainly I do, will always have this open on my desktop or open actually physically on my desk. And it's really helpful to understand the breakdown of these elements when you're starting to investigate, to understand what elements you need to be satisfying and to what standard. And so here, as you can see, as with all um, crimes across the Rome Statute, you have the objective elements, the, the physical acts, the mental elements, the mens rea, what the intention or the motive was behind, and then the contextual elements, which tend to be um, usually the most easy to, to prove. Um, again, as we've talked about, objects indispensable to survival by design are, are typically open ended. And um, what we understand from our engagement with the International Criminal Court and other practitioners um, in European war crimes prosecuting um, authorities is that we anticipate with the first prosecutions to, um, to be more classically linked to food and water. We anticipate it's not going to be something um, slightly more creative to start with, but we expect, as we see again with that trajectory with sex and gender-based violence, you start to see how that has developed over the years from, you know, that very narrow definition of, of rape and how that has expanded um, really domestically and internationally um, in the right direction. So, what do we mean by deprivation? This, again, is one of the material elements. The deprivation can take a number of different forms. These are the most common, as you can see on the slide, that we tend to look at in our in our work. 
um, depriving people of resources, destroying and stealing, um, blocking humanitarian aid, attacking water facilities, attacking agricultural um, production. And it's also, as we mentioned before, important to point that this can be both a commission and an omission. So preventing humanitarian aid coming in is, is also very common. Again, very much being seen in relation to, to Gaza. Deprivation will often take the form of multiple acts. So it's really important, particularly when we're investigating, to look at any particular patterns that we can draw from um, the broader context of, of the conduct of hostilities. So an attack on food sources or an attack on humanitarian aid may be only one single part of, of a, a broader network of criminality, which is why it's also important to be aware of non-food related deprivations. Um, yeah. Um, so again, as we mentioned before, there is no material element. The, the crime itself is a specific intent crime. Um, so this is um, where it's very important to establish the, the mental elements, which are um, the, the preeminent over the physical acts. So there is no requirement to demonstrate that people actually starved or died as a result of starvation. So they're a victim or a survivor's resourcefulness or resilience will, will not impact a perpetrator's responsibility. Notwithstanding that it's not a material element, it will still be important for a number of reasons, particularly for gravity and threshold um, in assessing how serious the crime is and whether it would be given um, priority for a prosecution. It's also going to be very important in terms of it's indicative of the mental elements of the crime. And then following any successful prosecution, um, it would be important in relation to uh, sentencing. Again, the, the next mental element uh, is that it must be aimed at civilians. And so when we talked about that uh, definition that we came up with at the beginning about targeted persons in conflict, that is very much linked to civilians. Um, and again, I, 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 I don't think I need to go into um, the definition of civilians uh, at this point. The next um, is, is the sort of real challenge in terms of dual use objects. And we'll get into this a little bit as we go through some of the investigative work we've been doing in Ukraine. But dual use objects, as you'll know, are those that may be used in direct support of military action, but also may be used by civilians. So for example, a military vehicle may be transporting civilians um, at various points. This they may then change the use of that and make it a legitimate military target. In urban warfare of the types that we see that we saw in Syria, certainly in the Balkans and now very much in Ukraine, evaluating the lawfulness of an attack on a dual use object is incredibly complex. Um, the assessment, of course, will always be done on a case by case basis, but some of the key questions that we are always asking when we're presented with uh, a case that we need to review for the Prosecutor General's Office or in a, a line of inquiry that we're looking at is whether there was any legitimate military targets in the area at the time and whether those civilian objects um, had changed use by virtue of it being used by the military. So moving then to uh, you know, the, the practice and, and how we're doing this inside uh, Ukraine at the moment. We knew very early on, we've, we've been headquartered in Ukraine since 2014, and we were fairly confident giving the players and giving the context and some of the um, early intelligence reporting that we were getting, that this conflict would be ripe for this type of method of warfare. And so we put together a proposal to monitor and investigate these and support the Ukrainian um, authorities to be able to do this both domestically and internationally. We are 10 months in with another eight months to go of investigation time before we move to a legal drafting stage. So a bit like a, um, a final trial brief way, we'd, we'd go into the kind of drafting phase. There's three principal pillars of the Starvation Mobile Justice Team. The first, of course, is, is Mariupol, which is what we're heavily involved in at the moment. The second is the naval blockade of the Black Sea ports and the grain theft, which we've just released the report on and um, are closing that pillar down. And then the final is these broader patterns of attacks on objects indispensable to survival. 
And we really are seeing very clear patterns across the whole of Ukraine. And so this particular, this last pillar has been um, where we've looked um, very extensively at the Kokovka Dam. And we're able to produce some really good and fast results on, on that with our open source providers. And then also, uh, this is where we've been looking at various other attacks on water infrastructure, um, agriculture and, and the like. Given the time, um, I'm just going to discuss two cases which are quite similar in scope. So both in seed context and also looking at attacks on OIS. But before I move to those two, I just want to frame how we go about looking at these um, investigative inquiries. Um, so when we're looking at these pillars, that when we talk about case selection and prioritisation, you can see this pyramid. Now, prosecutorial authorities or police and investigators will refer to the process of identifying, investigating and organising, analysing the elements of the relevant crimes as case building. At the bottom there, which is where you get the most information, is your crime base. And this really just refers to the specific acts, so the physical acts of what happened, which form the basis of the alleged crime. Um, detailing these involves a consideration in relation to starvation of both causes and then the impact itself. So looking about you know, the real basic questions, what happened, where it happened um, and when. As we move up the pyramid, the information tends to shrink and becomes much more difficult to access or analyse. Um, and the linkage section is referring to that link between the crime base and the perpetrator uh, in relation to the, the violation in question. So to establish that linkage, a prosecutor will need to identify both the perpetrator and explain in what way he or she may be responsible, which is also known as your mode of liability. Um, this critical tip of the triangle is really which will transform cases from an ordinary crime to a war crime or a crime against humanity or indeed uh, genocide as well. And just anecdotally, uh, it, it, this is a sort of challenge that we face with a lot of prosecutors that we work with outside of Ukraine, but also in Ukraine. So we work with very, very experienced senior prosecutors, state security um, who have been trained for decades to view these types of incidents in isolation. So when we're with a mobile justice team um, visiting a crime scene, whether that's a newly liberated area or indeed visiting a supermarket that's had a missile strike, their initial instinct is to view and preserve and collect information through the lens of, say, for example, in the supermarket scenario, 35 individual murders rather than a broader war crime um, and a, a, as a crime against humanity, which actually isn't part of the Ukrainian criminal code at this point in any event. So it, it's sort of pivoting away from how you investigate and, and um, establish this on a, on a wider level. So the first um, investigative piece I want to talk to you about was the first actual piece of work that we did on the Starvation Mobile Justice Team, which was um, an investigation into an incident in Chernihiv. Uh, and the reason that we selected Chernihiv was that it encompasses a really similar to Mariupol spectrum of attacks. But because of the, the scale and the significance of Mariupol, it really didn't get a lot of international attention. Um, but there was a lot of parallels and a lot of patterns. And we also really wanted at the outset to test our methodology when, and how we work with our open source providers and how we would engage with the prosecuting authorities. So actually on the same day as the drama theatre attack in Mariupol on the 16th of March, there was an attack on a bread queue in um, Chernihiv. Uh, where it, there was a shelling which killed 21 civilians and injured dozens uh, in the nearby area and including nearby buildings. Because of the nature of the, the, this being a distribution point for food, um, it had some of the kind of hallmarks of a starvation indicator that we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into. Before, during and after that particular attack, there was a um, a large degree of attacks on the heating infrastructure, on civilian dwellings, on markets, hospitals, and other food and water distribution points in Chernihiv, which again kind of indicated that this was more than an isolated incident and maybe part of this method of warfare that we wanted to ascertain. 
The challenge that we've faced with Chernihiv was that there was really inconsistent media reporting with um, lots of different uh, death totals being um, cited, lots of different weapons being um, cited. At, at one point, it looked like this was a, um, a troops on the ground with a, um, firing guns rather than this being a, a shell, a shelling incident. The attack occurred after the attempted encirclement of Chernihiv, which was part of this wider um, Kyiv offensive, specifically trying to um, besiege Kyiv from, from the west. So the, the background there, as you can see, there was an artillery strike um, in a predominantly and very densely residential area. 21 were killed. Um, and from our initial assessment, there was no obvious military target. So we wanted to try and identify whether there was any legitimate military targets in the area and whether this was a violation of international humanitarian law or indeed a war crime. So we engaged with the prosecutor's office. Um, there was an initial report by another organisation called Truth Hounds, which we uh, assessed and there were some gaps there that we needed to fill. And then we visited the, the site itself in May of this year. So what was complicated, again, from some of the media reporting and uh, some of the misinformation, disinformation that we were tackling, and also with some of the gaps around the Truth Hounds report, was um, the, the presence of Ukrainian military in the area at the time and whether that would transform this from a potentially unlawful to a lawful uh, incident. Um, we had information that there was potential um, territorial Ukrainian territorial army in the area um, and also um, uh, military presence in a nearby school, which would have been within range of this particular um, incident. So the main question for us was what was the intended target? Um, and what we were able to find is a, 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 a wide degree of information which we shared with various prosecuting authorities. And again, with, with all credit to a lot of the really impressive work of our open source providers. So we were able to find a, um, the 35th Guards Motorized Rifle Brigade who were in the area at the time. This is a Russian unit. They were likely to have fire batteries, including a multiple la um, launch rocket system and grads, which were both of those weapons were, were in use. Um, there was a digital profile that we were also able to ascertain from um, um, from mobile device data of a 120th Guards Artillery Brigade that was also within range. Uh, and this particular unit was known for using the both GRADS and the MLRS. Our assessment was that it was more than likely that a, a GRAD rocket system was used. And with the satellite imagery showing a, a line of Russian artillery assets, so howitzers within effective range of the impact site, as you can see there in the yellow, this was a densely populated uh, urban area and civilian loss of life and damage to civilian objects would, of course, been anticipated when using this type of weapon. Um, these are known as non-precision artilleries and it really, it, 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 our military assessment and legal assessment was that this would have been an excessive choice of weapon use in the context with which um, they were operating. Uh, we also were able to identify that there were drones in the operation at the time of this attack, and on, sixth, on the, particularly on the 16th of March, which would have given sufficient imagery, um, quality imagery to the Russian forces, fire controllers of the targets and of civilians being fired upon. And it was clear from the satellite imagery when you saw that the size of the bread queue from satellite imagery, and that it was very clearly a civilian gathering. There was no, um, nobody was in uniform. There was no sort of military formation. It was very much looked like a civilian queue, which was um, highly visible. And then finally, we were able to identify through a, a number of different capabilities that there were in fact no military presence um, uh, near the bread queue itself but further investigations were recommended in terms of the Ukrainian Territorial Defence Forces and where they were and the use of their um, presence in, in the school. Our final conclusion on the Chernihiv report was that the manner timing and, and the, the pattern of attacks around there was that there was a strong case of war crimes against directing attacks against civilian objects or civilians themselves, 
And there was also prima facie evidence of pattern analysis of the potential use of starvation as a method of warfare as well. We also looked at the war crime of terror, um, which is, is, is sort of continues to be kept in the periphery. So moving then just finally the last few slides on Mariupol. Um, and I just want to give a brief overview on, on our focus on Mariupol and, and why so many other investigators and open source providers have decided that it is um, it's, it's, it's incredibly challenging um, feed to document and to pull out analysis from. And so from the outset, we really wanted to try and focus on a very narrow element of the Mariupol con um, context in order not to get lost in, given the resources that we have. So we at the outset had tried to focus on humanitarian access impediments and attacks on humanitarian personnel within the siege itself. Um, this has broadened out a little bit and, and I'll explain why. So here's our sort of five point theory and I'll just run through it in, in very brief detail. In the context of, of sieges and particularly some of the sieges we've worked on in Syria and then also in, in Yemen with Tayaz, Mariupol was a very short siege, um, approximately 13 weeks in total. And within that, uh, there were significant periods of people exiting. So it really was a, a poor siege at, at various points. And this has been really important for us in understanding the intent behind certain attacks and patterns of conduct given that people were able to leave. So in the, the first week, in the first five days, there were between 100 and 130,000 individuals that left Mariupol. And then we enter into a real classic siege period where there was about 14 days when nobody was, was in or out. And then the next 17 days, we had about, give or take, 60,000 uh, individuals that left. And then again, um, in the beginning of April, about 30,000 individuals left to Zaporizhia. These population flows complicated the usual assessment of how we would look at a siege, um, which then led us to some information um, and a, a kind of case theory around filtration, particularly as we started to see some of that emerging elsewhere around the rest of Ukraine. Now, of course, as you'll know, a siege is, is not unlawful under international humanitarian law. But to abide by it um, and abide by the rules of it, uh, including access to food and uh, humanitarian aid and ensuring that that access is unimpeded and evacuations, um, it is notoriously difficult to, um, to, to, to conduct a lawful siege. What we do know is that from the 24th of February, there was absolutely no access to international organisations to deliver aid to Mariupol. And this pattern um, was replicated across other occupied territories as well. We also saw very little, if any, attempts to made uh, by the Russian um, uh, forces to alleviate the civilian suffering during this um, during the siege. And there was, of course, as you will know and see, a sustained bombardment campaign against civilians to the near obliteration of the city. Given the time, I'm just going to talk very briefly about that first pillar of the theory. So um, what sort of attacks we were looking at on a critical infrastructure and on objects indispensable to survival and how we have tried to understand the scale and severity of those particular attacks. So she will come back to that one in a moment. Um, almost immediately following the full scale invasion, we started to see reports emerging of attacks on this critical infrastructure. Our particular um, investigation is focused on energy, heat and electricity. This was really critical during the early freezing temperatures of uh, the end of March and uh, end of February and March and the impact that these had both on communication, but also on access to healthcare and hospitals. And um, so it wasn't simply just a, a heating in, um, issue, but also how that had a knock on effect on what was able to be um, provided in terms of energy in, in hospitals. It, we also looked at water, given that there was sustained water shortages and an inability to repair the damage that was being caused due to the continual shelling and attacks. And we've really seen, again, these attacks on water across various points of Ukraine, 
again looking at Kokovka and then Mykolaiv with a water pipeline attack there. The next um, was medical care. Uh, and the significant impact that medicine shortages had causing numerous deaths and severe illnesses. Whilst food and water, and we saw these reports being scavenged, you know, radiators being bled to, to drink the water out of these buildings, the lack of medicine was, was not replaceable. So it was very difficult when you, when you didn't have that access. And then food producing infrastructure and the attacks there. This distribution point, as we said, sort of carried across from Chernihiv to, to Mariupol. And that was why we, we were looking at particularly the drama theatre um, and that being used as a distribution point, both for evacuations, but also for humanitarian relief, um, shelter uh, and food and water and basic necessities. Through a primary data set, we were able to um, uh, verify and geolocate 557 incidents, 435 of those related to critical infrastructure damage, and we were able to geolocate and um, verify 77 entries of uh, the possible presence um, and firing positions of Russian forces. We then have taken, and we're still in the process of understanding and unravelling this data, but data from the Conflict Observatory using artificial intelligence learning tools to identify and damage map um, the buildings in Mariupol and place that on a, um, on a time slider so that we're able to understand whether there is a correlation between evacuations and then the, the attacks on critical infrastructure and on the attacks on humanitarian evacuation corridors. Our um, uh, approach with critical infrastructure, and again, as we talked about before with, with damage mapping and dual use objects, is to use a two prong test. And that is to identify whether a particular piece of infrastructure may have qualified as a military objective. And that will be looking at its nature, location and purpose and whether it made an effective contribution to the military action. And then the second prong, whether it's total or partial destruction, capture or neutralization would offer a definitive military advantage. And so we then would move from there into the, the, the rest of the IHL principles, whether there was any precaution, uh, precautionary measures taken and whether the attack itself and the weapons used was proportionate. But I think what we are very clearly seeing in the Mariupol report will um, be released in February, we believe, or potentially at the end of February uh, to coincide with the anniversary. And then there'll be a forward facing report and then the, the broad, broader legal analysis will form part of the Article 15 communication. So this is um, the final image that I would um Maybe it's not, oh, it's coming up perfect. Um, I don't know how, oh, there we go. So I think just to end in conclusion, I think what's really important um, and has been a, a tragic outcome of the conflict in, in Ukraine has been the way that starvation and starvation and conflict is starting to be viewed. And I think Ukraine has changed so much globally. Um, and the war and Russia's weaponization of food has profoundly impacted global food insecurity. But I think it's also started to have um, a change in terms of perception and it has the ability to change the face of starvation. And what we hope and believe should be precipitating the first prosecution of starvation as a method of warfare um, on the international stage. So we hope that this is in years to come, what we understand starvation to look like rather than um, those images that we saw at the beginning of, of sort of pot bellied children. So I'll pause there and I will um, look at the Q&A. If there is any questions, um, please feel free to ask. Uh, Katrina, thank you very much for this fantastic presentation. It was a wonderful pr pr presentation, not only because you provided all the doctrinal developments about the war crime of uh, uh, starvation of civilians, but also you talk about real work, your investigative work with uh, real examples and, and cases from the, the conflict uh, in Ukraine. And you highlighted also the issue of the open um, resource uh, evidence and provided 
health, which is very, very important. It's a, it's a big, big issue. You can discuss some other time together, you know, with the global food insecurity. And I, I encourage uh, all of you, all the participants I wrote at the Q&A, you know, you can post your questions at the Q&A or actually now you can raise your hand. Uh, you can use your microphone and ask a question. I can see a hand, uh, sorry, with teams, I'm not the, the best one. So if this hand would like to take the floor, please do it. <laughs> Thank you. Carolina, it's you. You can take the floor. I can see now. Um, Carolina, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we have you. OK, perfect. Sorry, my connection is bad. And thank you for talk. I appreciate attending this session. Um, I wanted to ask, um, so in terms of the legal framework surrounding starvation, you said that in order to verify an act of starvation, they, the number of deaths or humanitarian cases are not a statistics that is used to, to verify such cases. So my question is, what are the main factors that you believe are important uh, to verify such international cases and don't you believe that with factors not like being um, not uh, quantitative there might be the issue of uh, you know what is what we see has happened for example with the genocide convention so you know this um, problem of actually um, verifying and holding states accountable and not allowing them to actually escape uh, legal 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 accounts. Thanks thank Carolina. Yeah, Can thank you. you. Think of something there is there is one more question. Mm -hmm. Another would you like me to collect some questions? Is that okay or do you want to talk, to respond to each of them? Maybe you want to respond to each of them. Yeah, so. I yeah, I'll, I'll maybe I'll try to respond to Carolina and then and then I can I think it's Uliana who's next. Um, thank you, Carolina, for that question. I think it's a really, really good one and really important to just to clarify, because it is a bit of um, uh, sometimes it's sort of a bit. Yeah, maybe I wasn't particularly clear. So the material elements of the crime do not require that starvation is proved as a result. So there's no, as a prosecutor, um, there is no legal requirement to establish one or, or a multitude of deaths. That said, most prosecutors who are looking at a crime base, particularly on the international level, would be very uninterested in a crime that has no impact. It wouldn't, it's unlikely to meet a gravity threshold test that would be required um, for, for a preliminary examination to be open, for example. So whilst it's not a material element, it is really important in terms of establishing what happened. And as I said, also establishing what was intended to happen from the perspective of the perpetrator. But I think that the parallel that you make with genocide and the sort of quantitative challenges there is a really good one. And, and for many reasons, that's why we've tried to stay away from comparisons with genocide, um, despite there being a very clear framework where the, the two, there's a nexus. Uh, and also, of course, because both are specific intent crimes. Ukraine has sort of forced us to relook at that, particularly given some of the indicators potentially of, of genocidal acts within Ukraine. And of course, the prosecutors have interest in, in pursuing that. So I think the, the problem with, with verifying um, is, is a real, it's a real challenge. But the factors that we need to look at and the primary factors, as you remember that pyramid, is the crime base itself. So looking at the acts of deprivation, and then once you've established that there are this, you know, a pattern of, of deprivation that you're seeing, whether that is preventing humanitarian workers from accessing a besieged area, or whether it is, you know, bombarding, um, you know, food producing areas, um, or for example, in Tigray, where we saw, you know, scorched earth policies where um, agriculture was just kind of burnt to the ground. 
once you move past that crime base, it's really trying to understand what the intention was behind this. And that is something that we tend to verify and establish through circumstantial evidence. So whether there is patterns of behaviour, whether there are factors to demonstrate that there is um, the other kind of conduct of hostilities is not abiding by international humanitarian law. And from there, whether we can piece together both that intention to deprive, but then also the more trickier mens rea, um, the intention to actually starve a civilian population. So I think it's um, it's certainly not without its challenges. And, and one of the primary challenges really is because we've never had this prosecuted before, we don't have the kind of red lines that you have in other cases. So I worked for a long time at the Yugoslavia Tribunal and there was you know, lots of precedent there on targeting and um, and on various different crimes. But with this crime, we're, we're still a little bit in the dark. So I, I hope that's helpful. Um, thank you. Thank you, Katriona. Can I suggest something? Thank you very much, Katriona, yes. Uh, can I suggest something? Can I read the, co the, the questions we have at the Q&A and then finally I will give the floor to Uliana? you know, for who has raised her hand. So there are uh, two connections from Nana. One, it's about the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, conflict as we speak now. Um, and her question is, how would you assess the recent, uh, uh, according to Nana, I think cleansing of uh, in the area in Nagorno-Karabakh, precipitated by a month long blockade in regards to legal parameters around starvation. Uh, there is also a question about your assessment from Ed regarding your, um, uh, have you or your team drawn any comparisons between your previous work and what is currently happening in Gaza? So there are two cases regarding, there are two questions regarding cases, I would say. Uh, and then Nana also asks, and I will give the floor to Liana, I'm not going to be unfair, uh, asks about the open source um, investigation, you know, the open source, um, to what extent would you say that the open source evidence, uh, documentation, and archiving, arch archiving, archiving can affect prosecuting moving forward. You know, uh, in the question, who curates and manages the archives you rely on currently? And uh, if you would like to to address these questions, so and then I'm going, we can finish up. You know, with Uliana's final question. Is that okay? Yeah, perfect. Sure. So um, on the on the the first question from Nana on on Armenia, so we we haven't done a huge amount of work on this at all. We've been very much focused on um, Ukraine and and other um, uh, situations as well. But I think what we're seeing and and some of the peripheral reading that we've done as a team, um, and we are hoping to get into that um, situation with some more uh, in some more detail in due course. But what we are seeing is, of course, when you have a situation, and again, parallels to, to Gaza, where humanitarian access and civilians are being entirely besieged um, and cut off from um, food sources, cut off from humanitarian access, prevented from being able to leave. These are all the hallmarks of IHL violations, which would then move potentially along that spectrum to whether that's war crimes or crimes against humanity. Um, and I think there is, you know, of course, there's a there's a long history inside Armenia with with um, famine and starvation, and so it is. Um, yeah, it, it, I think it's it's something that we would very much like to look into more. And then certainly, Ed, in relation to Gaza, I think the comparisons are, you know, they're they're um, irresistible to make. Really, I think the. The pattern of attacks that we're seeing, you know, both from from Syria to Gaza to um, to Ukraine, is is a very familiar playbook with the the, the way in which um, weapons are being used, the way that civilians are being used, the way that hospitals and safe places or designated safe places, and the dual use aspect that we talked about. Um, it is something that. Um, it's incredibly, incredibly challenging, but I think there are very, very um, vivid comparisons to be drawn in in the in the method of warfare that's being used and in the impact of of civilians. Um, 
And then finally, in terms of the question in relation to open source, I think, um, thanks Nana for that, that's also a really good one. So we have an, a number, it's a bit of a patchwork, we have our own relational database that we've created um, within the Starvation Mobile Justice team, where we preserve an archive store log um, uh, and preserve that information through um, uh, a number of different verified processes. We also have access and archive into the mnemonic database and have access to a kind of a wider database with other providers that are using that. Um, and then we have our own sort of internal non-data non-database relational archiving as well. And that's also in addition to some of the processes that our providers use. So um, I think that you know how open source documentation is going to be used in any future prosecution is very much um, a live question and one that we're discussing with various experts in relation to admissibility. Um, within the Ukrainian context, there's still a bit of a perception that open source is best for lead generating rather than being a kind of independent source itself, whereas on the international level, we've we've moved on a little bit from that. So I think there's still a lot to be um, understood and how this is being used is still in its really also in its infancy. Um, but certainly from from our perspective, it has transformed the way that we've investigated from you know, 2019 with with Bell and Cat in Yemen, it really has changed the course of our work for for the better. And then maybe Liam, oh, yeah. thank Liam, you very please. Oh, yeah. Hi, uh, thank you so much for this presentation and for giving providing us with a legal overview. Uh, that was very very insightful. My question is whether um, at any point in this uh, investigation mm, or in the legal um, aspects, will you be looking at the psychological impact of uh, using this crime? Because uh, as you probably and many of you know, um, death from hunger uh, in the 20th century affected millions of Ukrainians. And this uh, genocide is called Holodomor, and it is being recognized more since 2022 because of the parallel. And I'm wondering, like, yeah, could you tell us uh, a bit more about that? Thank you very much, Liana. Thanks, Liana. I think it's a great, a really great and very important question. And I think it it really leads me back to this, this point of of. of why the crime itself is so important in terms of fair labelling and why when you have other available crimes that might be easier to prosecute that we still try and encourage prosecutors and investigators to look at starvation itself because it's because of that labelling point that it has a very um, specific impact on communities and on individuals themselves which is you know an, an intergenerational impact and as you as you rightly recognise the framework of countries that have experienced famine, forced famine and deliberate famine in its recent history is one that provides um, yeah, a, a significant impact psychologically and socially and, and culturally. And so that is why we're really encouraging um, a, a range of different prosecutors to be able to capture the, the, the extent of this violation. And I think what we see across, you know, not just inside Ukraine, but but in other contexts as well, is that there's so much, again, the parallels, there's, there's so many parallels of sexual and gender-based violence, is that you have this shame where you have the indignity of, of starvation and the, what that entails in terms of choosing which child to feed and which child to not feed, which child is able to get to the hospital and which you can't which neighbour you're going to steal from and which neighbour you're not going to share your food with. It's all of these small insidious acts that uh, that internalise, there's a lot of shame that is internalised with that conduct and a lack of recognition that this is something that is being done to them rather than something that is, you know, a, a personal failing. So I think how it's affected our work in Ukraine is, is on a number of different levels because you have this very recent history but I think what's interesting, and as you know, as a practical example, Ileana, is that because obviously the word Holodomir really does link to food, um, 
I think our engagement with prosecutors and investigators inside of Ukraine, when we talk to them about starvation, they immediately think to, to that scenario where you had, you know, mass starvation, significant deaths um, and death toll. And here, of course, in the current conflict, we're not seeing those types of, of deaths from starvation. We're seeing them from attacks on critical infrastructure and, and the like. So it's 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 both helpful in framing, but also it causes its own challenges because the impact is very different this time around. Um, but I think it does galvanize that community and has created a real sense of fear within the Ukrainian community that this is this is being done to them again. And so with the same, you know, parties to the conflict. So um, I think it's 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 a critical um, feature to our to our work and, and a really important question. So thank you for raising it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for Katrina for addressing all these questions. And uh, I want to thank all the participants, you know, speaking about the importance of this crime, not to be only acknowledged, but at some states to be brought uh, before uh, made me uh, think of the expressivist value, as we say, of, of international criminal law, something we have seen with other crimes, how important it was to convey particular uh, messages. And uh, also the fact that until very recently it was not even included as a, as a crime in a non-international armed conflict in the Rome Statute, that speaks volumes. Uh, but it looks that uh, the situation changes uh, when it comes to legal uh, developments, unfortunately due to reality, reality forces us. And um, uh, unless you would like to, to, to add something, uh, I would like to thank you uh, on behalf of the War Crimes Research Group for this wonderful discussion. Uh, I'm pretty sure we will have the opportunity to discuss again, to have you again in person this time uh, in London and to talk about other developments, but also other aspects of, of, of your work, which is a very important part of work. I would like also to thank Liz very much for accommodating this webinar. Uh, so, Katrina, you have the final word once more. Thank you very much. For us. No, thank you. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to, to talk and um, yeah, really impressed by, by the questions and I'm very happy. Feel free to reach out at any point if there's any follow up or any um, further inquiries. And um, my door is yeah, very much open. So thank you. We are very grateful about that and we really hope we are going to host you in person uh, soon in London to discuss even further. Thank you all for your questions and participation once more. Uh, have a nice uh, day and we're looking forward to seeing you to our next uh, seminar. Thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye.